Good evening, everybody, and welcome to the Alliance International um, International Development Question Time. We um, are just waiting for uh, participants to join. I can see the numbers uh, rising. So if you just give us another 30 seconds, letting people join and set themselves up, and we will get started. Thank you very much. Okay, good evening, everyone. My name is Talat Yakub, and I'm your chair for this evening's question time with uh, candidates and um, parties in the coming 2021 election. Um, today, we have an opportunity to hear from five of the parties currently represented in the Parliament. Um, it is important that I say that when you go to your ballot paper, there will maybe other parties also there, but at the um, this panel will include those who have currently been uh, in the last parliamentary session represented in the Parliament. This is an opportunity to hear from them about how they plan to support the international development sector and international development as a whole. In this, uh, in this panel session, in this question time, you will also have the opportunity to ask questions and you can do that by using the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. Now, if you've used Zoom before, you will notice that you can't see everybody in a little grid. That's because we're using a webinar function. But uh, as is on your screen now, you have the opportunity to click on the Q&A at the bottom of your screen and you can ask questions there and they will come through to me. We will try and ask as many questions as we can, bearing in mind that we don't have that long. We have disabled the chat box so that we um, are not distracting the um, uh, candidates whilst they are responding. However, like I said, the Q&A box is available. Please also know that there is live transcription, which you'll be, you can access and live transcription should come at the bottom. And I'm seeing this as much of a reminder to myself as to the panelists and to those who ask questions that uh, please make sure you speak slowly to give um, the person who is typing the transcription um, time to actually uh, digest everything that is being said. So, as I said, the opportunity, it's an opportunity to focus on Scotland's contribution to sustainable development and to hear from parties and to hear about pri parties' priorities. We will be asking uh, key questions, but after this, you also have an opportunity to read the Alliance's five point plan on what it's calling for this next Scottish government to do and its key asks um, for uh, parties during this election. I'm delighted that we have representatives from five of the parties here. We have Katie Clark from Scottish Labour, Jenny Gilruth from SNP, Morris Golden from the Scottish Conservatives, we have Liam MacArthur from Scottish Liberal Democrats, and we hope to have Patrick Harvey from the Scottish Greens, but I'm going to assume that there may be some technical difficulties there, and hopefully he'll be able to join us uh, just in a moment. You have an opportunity to submit your questions throughout the evening, so don't just wait for me to say now is the time to ask your questions. So please be thinking of those questions and please add them into the Q&A at the bottom throughout. We will try and get through as many as possible. Whilst you're thinking of questions, we're going to go straight to a Q&A. We'll have three or four sets of questions in rounds of three. And then we will go to closing statements, which are two minutes each from each of the candidates. Starting off, we'll hear the first of our pre-submitted questions from international partners. The first is Herbert Kashilila in Tanzania. First question is from him. I'll be asking him to uh, come onto screen, please. Good evening, speaking from Tanzania. Um, I represent a local NGO um, in Tanzania with a partner Scottish NGO. Uh, we both have benefited from Scottish and UK government support uh, to support poor communities who have better water security and improved uh, health and livelihood through our work. It's about worrying um, about aid cuts to the tune of 50 to 7%. And we feel, you know, uh, there must be good ways of saving without disadvantaging the poorest who, had, who need safe water. And at the moment, they're at the sharp end of a climate change. 
but they also need to be immunized with a global pandemic. I know this is a difficult time of the of the at the globe, uh, but also we know this is not a devolved power and the Scottish government. But we feel this does not mean that we cannot we can turn a blind eye to the cause of uh, safe water and clean water. So we call us as a good citizens, good global citizen to know if your party is really going to support this massive aid cut. And if it is not, what clear action will it take? Thank you. Thank you, Herbert. Before we go to any um, answers, we'll be taking them in rounds of three. So the next question is a pre-recorded video from Alejandro Aliman. Hello everyone, uh, good evening. Many thanks for inviting us to this important event. My name is Alejandro Aleman. I work for Centro Humboldt, which is a partner organization of Christian Aid in Central America. I am also the coordinator of Climate Action Network in Latin America. We are really, really pleased to participate in this important event. Scotland will host the International Climate Negotiations COP26 on November this year, so Scotland will uh, call the attention of the world to this event. Here uh, my question will be uh, how Scotland can help vulnerable regions like Central America to deal with the climate change impacts, particularly how you can help these regions like Central America to reach climate justice and to receive compensation for the impacts of climate change uh, in, its vulnerable, in its vulnerable people, uh, particularly uh, the impacts on those regions of the Caribbean coast of Honduras, Nicaragua, Guatemala and El Salvador, which has been recently strongly affected by climate related events. events. Thank you. And the final pre-recorded question in this round from our international partners is from Maurice, Maurice Cuzera, who is Director of Water Aid in Rwanda. Hello, uh, I am Maurice Cuzera, Country Director of Water Aid in Rwanda. Thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to ask a question at this particular event. With the support from the Scottish Government and in collaboration with the Scottish Water, Water Aid is implementing an impactful project called Nyamagabe Alba to provide water sanitation and hygiene in communities and schools of Nyamagabe District, which is located in the southern province of Rwanda. The project is changing the lives of thousands of people and at the same time providing hope for a better future through availability of clean water, good sanitation and good hygiene. For that purpose, we believe that Scotland has a contribution to make to tackle the global water and sanitation crisis in the developing world. I want to ask uh, a question to candidate. Will you preserve Scottish government's funding to projects like ours and in which areas do you think the funding from the Scottish government can be more effective? Thank you. A huge thank you to international partners for those uh, questions uh, and for those in um, Tanzania, Herbert in Tanzania, who has come to the event to ask questions. Um, just as a uh, reminder, both for our audience and for the panel, key questions are asking, um, how can Scotland help vulnerable regions like Central America deal with the impact of climate change? Despite the power not, not being devolved, what will you do about massive aid cuts? And if you do not support them, what clear actions will you take? And finally, um, the question was, will you preserve Scottish government funding to projects like ours in Rwanda? And in which areas do you think funding can be most effective? I'll be starting with Katie Clark, then going to Jenny Gilruth and Katie.
Katie, you have uh, three minutes, please, maximum. Thank you. Um, well, Harpa, a, a really, really important question about UK aid cuts, which are shameful, probably illegal, and are going to be counterproductive if indeed they go ahead. Um, Labour at a UK level and a Scottish level are strongly opposed to the cuts and at a Westminster level we're trying to force a vote on the issue to try and stop them happening. We're obviously hoping that we'll be able to persuade um, enough government MPs that this isn't something that they're willing to actually vote for. The UK government's trying to avoid a vote at the moment so that I think says something about how confident they are about whether they can actually get support. This is going to have a massive effect. It's going to have a massive effect on many, many countries. As you say, the, um, you know, the, the cuts are in the region of 50%. In some countries, they're more than that. Um, so even countries like Yemen, where you know UK is a UK pen holder, it's cuts of 50%. And that's at the same time as, for example, um, we're granting 6.5%. £7 billion pounds of arms control licences. So um, I obviously think there's wider issues in terms of our foreign, foreign policy intervention. Um, Helandro asked about um, COP26, which of course is taking place in Scotland. I think this has got to be a massive priority for all of us over the next few months. It's essential that the goals agreed at COP26 are ambitious and are radical. Um, but they also have to be delivered. And one of the problems we've got is that the goals that were agreed at the last um, international conference at um, Paris aren't actually um, being met in the sense that we're not on track to get there. So I support and Labour support trying to get um, targets um, to be achieved by 2030 that are actually delivered. And I very much hope that there's you know, a real big debate round about this and indeed um, round about new finance targets in terms of what the richer countries do um, in relation to um, underdeveloped countries. Um, Morris um, asked about clean water in Rwanda, obviously a massive issue, um, water sanitation and hygiene in Rwanda. Um, in terms of the specific um, question you ask, what, what, what funding is most effective? Well, I think we have to listen. I, don't, I think governments have got to listen to those on the ground and those actively involved in these issues to see which are most effective. But obviously, girls and women are specifically affected. Um, and, you know, in terms of what's most effective, um, then it's important um, that we make sure that clean water is seen as a major um, part of the international development package. I would have thought with everything that's happened with COVID, um, the issues round about the ramifications of poor hygiene are, are more obvious than ever. So um, hopefully I've kept within my time and um, I'm grateful to give those brief answers. <laughs> thank you. Can I turn to Jenny Gilruth from SNP, please? Thank you, Tala, and thank you to Herbert for the first question. So in answer to your question, no, the SNP does not support an aid cut. Um, as you rightly mentioned, that is at this moment in time still reserved, but um, from an SNP perspective, we voted to restore um, the aid budget back to the 0.7% commitment, and that would happen, obviously, in independent Scotland. But I just want to make that point before I go into the detail. I think the decision by the Conservative UK government to cut overseas aid in the middle of the pandemic was deplorable. You know, as we know, the pandemic has caused untold distress um, to people and economies all over the world, not least the world's most vulnerable. So it was not the time for the government to be turning its back in terms of its uh, responsibilities to our international partners. Um, and in the same week, though, that the UK government pushed ahead with that cut, I was really proud that we in the SNP Scottish Government announced a £2 million worth of funding to help our partner countries in the fight against COVID-19. That was ring fence funding that was announced in the programme for government. I think that's good. But obviously, as I've mentioned, as an SNP candidate, I want us to go further and to be really ambitious about Scotland's role as a, a good global citizen. Um, Alejandro, you asked a question about COP26. And as you know, Scotland will welcome leaders from all over the world. Hopefully in November, we hope it's going to be a physical event, COVID restrictions permitting. I think it will be a great opportunity to showcase some of Scotland's world leading approach, uh, approaches and legislation to climate change and also to strengthen our commitment to global cooperation and to tackle that challenge of the climate crisis. I think COP26 needs to be inclusive and to represent the people who are most affected by climate change, which you touched upon. So, of course, our partner countries and in international development need to have their voices heard, and I'm keen that we do that work. Um, so that, I hope, answers your question with regard to COP26. And the third question was from 
uh, Morris, and that was with regard to um, water aid. I think, Morris, um, in terms of your question, you'll know we recently reviewed our international development offer uh, within the Scottish Government, and access to clean water and hygiene facilities was a really a key theme that came out of that review, particularly, I think, in light of the pandemic. Um, a lot of the support that we offer in that space comes to the Climate Justice Fund at the moment, and over £2 million has come from the University of Strathclyde and the SNP Scottish Government working together to extend the Water Futures Programme. That's helping more communities in the Lower Shire Basin and rural Malawi at the moment. But specifically, you asked, will we preserve funding? Um, I can't tell you just now about the funding from my party because we haven't announced our manifesto. That's a wee bit above my pay grade. But what I would say to you is, um, I, I don't think we're going to step away from our commitments. And um, certainly in my role as minister, and I know I'm not here in that capacity, but in all of that work, it's really important that we listen to the views of our partner countries and through the review um, that was coming through loud and clearly, you know, we don't have all the answers in Scotland. We need to listen to our partner countries' needs and we need to have that collaborative approach. And I will pause there, Talix, and probably will. Thank you. I know it's counterintuitive for me to ask for answers within three minutes and then also to slow down for you and who is um, typing. I know that is counterintuitive. I apologise, um, but we, if we could do that for poor Ewan, who's sitting in, and typing and giving us the captions as well, I'm very aware that I talk too quickly. So um, if we can go to Morris Golden from Scottish Conservatives and then Liam McCarthy from Scottish Liberal Democrats. Thank you. Uh, thank you. And uh, great question there from Herbert. I mean, first of all, as as was highlighted in the question, um, this UK aid is a reserved matter. Uh, the UK government has said they want to restore to pre-COVID levels as soon as possible, but clearly the UK government has invested billions of pounds in, in the vaccine and supporting our NHS. But even with that next financial year, they'll be allocating 10 billion pounds to aid. And UK will still be the second largest donor in the G7 higher than Italy, Japan, Canada and the USA, and I'm confident it will remain a world leader um, with very few countries doing more to lift global communities out of poverty or tackle climate change. Also within that, there's figures that don't count as aid, such as the half a billion pounds that goes in peacekeeping and security, or IMF lending that uh, contributes 4.4 billion pounds. And it's also worth considering that during Labour's time at Westminster, in the first 13 years, uh, they spent 62 billion in aid, and the Conservative government within just six years had already surpassed that figure. So that's the track record in terms of comparisons. But I hope that soon we will restore the UK level of contributions. Alejandro talked about COP26, and I think there's probably two things I would like to see uh, focused on. The, the first is I want Scotland to be a showcase for expertise, uh, a, a place that global communities look to, to see how to implement climate change policies. But unfortunately, what we've seen is a litany of failures on climate change from recycling targets in 2013 still not met today. In fact, our recycling rate is lower now than it was in 2016. We ship out three tonnes of waste every minute out of Scotland and incineration has gone up 400%, making Scotland the ashtray of Europe. Add on to that biodiversity targets not being met and you really have an embarrassing situation and I think the next Scottish Government must step up to match ambitious targets with ability to meet those. I think the other aspect is to showcase um, Scotland's technologies and skills and look to uh, shift some of that expertise overseas for the benefit of the global community. Um, the last question, Morris, great name by the way, on access to clean water. Um, I graduated with a master's from the UNESCO International Water Law Institute and I, I worked uh, with the cross-border 
International Boundary and Water Commission between Mexico and the USA. So I understand the issues in downstream. We had Mexico requiring sanitation and drinking water and the USA, while wanting those things as well, we're also wanting water to be used on gardens and swimming pools. So there's an inequity there. And in many riparian states, it's, it's the same. I hope that the uh, UN Watercourses Convention of 1997, which the UK is a signatory, signatory to, offers a way of hope for managing those, because otherwise, I think globally, we could face wars over water. At a more localised level, I'd like to see the funding continue uh, from the Scottish Government, but also uh, use the expertise we have with Scottish Water in terms of providing the necessary infrastructure to provide sanitation and drinking water, as well as other uses. Thank you. Thank you. Liam MacArthur, Scottish Liberal Democrats. Thanks, Talat, and let the others, can I thank the Alliance for hosting uh, the hustings. Um, the cut to uh, the aid budget is, um, as I think Jenny said, uh, utterly deplorable. Um, any credit the Conservatives can take for the amount that has been spent, I think is owed largely um, to the previous coalition when the Liberal Democrats were the ones um, that drove the agenda for um, putting into law uh, the 0.7% uh, target. Um, that was, uh, a, I think, an achievement that rightly gained cross-party support. Uh, but I think it's important to acknowledge the uh, the contribution that particularly my colleagues uh, Michael Moore and Jeremy Purvis um, played in 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 in, in, in uh, making that achievement. Uh, and I think uh, while well, Jenny may say that it, with independence we have an opportunity to 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 set that get back to that 0.7% uh, target, uh, it does um, uh, I think seem to me that what we would have is a 0.7 target of of a, a significantly lesser amount and the, uh, the 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 level of of influence the level of interventions that we could make uh, would be inhibited as a result the cut itself it may have appeared an an easy thing to do relatively speaking in the current climate but i think the long term damage uh, is is uh, is likely to be significant and as somebody who, who fiercely opposed Brexit, who believes that it was an act of self-harm on the part of the UK as a whole, um, the very point was about being more internationalist in our outlook, or that is what we were told. And it seems to me that the cut in this budget, particularly at a time um, of, of real stress and, and, and need, um, is uh, it goes entirely against the, the grain of what we were told Brexit was uh, about. I think we will see this um, this re-established. I think Katie's right um, that that any vote on this would attract cross-party support, and I'm hopeful that, that that we'll see that happen. In terms of Alejandro's um, uh, question, I, I think in terms of climate justice, I rather suspect it will look different for different countries. Um, so we need solutions that actually make sense uh, in the countries and um, that they're applied. And that means that COP26 absolutely needs to hear from the global south, needs to hear from those who are adversely affected most uh, by climate change. Now, I know from my involvement with the cross-party group in Malawi and the involvement I've had with Malawi over a number of parliamentary sessions, that what we've seen is aid that, that was there to support measures to increase sustainability and the, and the long-term development in those countries being transferred into uh, emergency aid to deal with whether it's floods, whether it's droughts, um, but immediate disasters. And I think, again, the long-term implications of that are very serious and it's probably something that COP26 has to get a hold of. Um, and to Morrissey's question, I, I won't repeat what uh, Morris Golden said about um, the centrality of, of water and clean, safe water and the importance of that for a whole variety of reasons, but also the, the risk that it plays in terms of igniting uh, disputes and, 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 uh, and wars across the globe. Uh, but I think the, uh, the, the point about the funds that the Scottish Government, and to its credit, has been able to put in and the interventions that have been able to make be made on the back of that uh, are ones that enjoy cross-party support. 
like Jenny, I am the, our manifesto, the Scottish Liberal Democrat manifesto, is still being drafted, um, but I would very much hope that it would continue to support um, that funding and indeed possibly look to, to enhance it. I think there's also things that might need to be done around small grants that um, are no longer uh, available in the way that they were. Uh, and I know there's a risk in spreading the jam too thinly, uh, but I think they were able to make interventions that, that were very significant in the communities and in the countries uh, where they were targeted. But I would, I would hope that we would see the International Development Fund that Morris was speaking about protected over the course of the next, uh, the next parliamentary session. Thank you to all panellists and candidates there for their um, answers that were pretty much right on time. So that is very much appreciated. Uh, I'm very aware that um, Patrick Harvey hasn't been able to join us so far. Um, as a consequence, just to let you all know and reassure the audience, we will um, write up these questions and ask him for written answers to the questions where he hasn't, as he hasn't been um, available to participate today. Hopefully he can still join us. We're still here for a little while. And if you can, we will get him to um, uh, log in and uh, answer what he can whilst he is here. So um, thank you for your answers. We'll move to another round of three questions, which includes pre-recorded questions and some questions from the audience. We've had uh, one question come in. Um, I'll read out this question and then provide you with the next two. Given that Scotland has committed to zero carbon, should we reduce the amount of international flights through our airports and also reduce our economic dependence on tourism? It's a question that's come in from the audience this evening. And our second question is from a young person about global development education. Can we please go to Rowan, a high school pupil in Fife? Hi. Hi. Um, so my name is Rowan and I'm a senior at Bell Baxter High School in Fife. Um, firstly, I'd just like to say thank you for this opportunity. It's really important for me to be able to get my voice out there. Um, so my question is about global citizenship. As a young person, I would like to see more people learning about the world and becoming active global citizens who understand how they can help achieve a more just and sustainable future. Will your party commit to increasing investment in global citizenship, like funding development education system centres around Scotland? Thank you. Thank you, Rowan. Thanks so much for being here and answering that question. Um, we have a final question in this round from CF partner in Zambia and Malawi, Father Leonard Chiti, who has a pre-recorded video. If we could play that, please. I think that given the historical links between you know, Scotland and Malawi, my question will be, you know, besides um, the um, the general response to these disasters, such as flooding in the southern part of Malawi, what else are you doing? What else do you plan to do mm -hmm. to help, um, you know, mitigate, you know, the adverse impact of such disasters? Um, it's one thing to pull out your pound and send it to Malawi when there's an outcry for emergency uh, support. But can we engage in you know, preventative measures to the extent to which we can prevent some of these things from happening uh, so that we are not dealing with the symptoms of um, uh, the root problem, but we're dealing with the root causes of, um, you know, some of the problems that we encounter today. Thank you. So just as a reminder of those questions, firstly, it was about um, a reduction of international travel and reliance on tourism to tackle climate change. And it was Ryan's question, which was about um, citizenship education, global citizenship education in schools. And the third was about uh, mitigating the root cause rather than the symptoms uh, when it comes to uh, disasters and disasters appeals abroad. Um, if I could please start with uh, Jenny Gulruth and then we'll go to Morris. Thank you, Jenny. Thanks, Tal. Um, so I'm not sure who the first question is from, but with regard to the question itself, yes, I think the pandemic means we, we need to think about um, global travel more. Um, I've not left the, the country since July 2019, not that I'm counting when I was last on, in a hot country on holiday. And I think it's the kind of thing that we all used to do at the drop of a hat. We would think of going on holiday maybe once or twice a year, and we really do need to think more generally about how that's affecting the planet. 
But the pandemic also shows us that we can do the things that we maybe thought we had to travel for from home. So, as I mentioned, we've just uh, conducted a review of international development, which you know about, Talat. And uh, I was able to do that largely from sitting here in my house in Fife. So things that we thought we had to travel to before, we can do uh, thanks to technology and we should be doing it because of climate change. So it does necessitate um, behavioural change as well. And that reliance on economic, uh, I think it was an economic dependence on tourism uh, is important. We also need to think about where we're driving tourists as well and not constantly having them gathering in hotspots. For example, I look at Edinburgh um, as a kind of hotspot for tourism. And I think there are other parts of the country we would be better to, to look at in terms of how we drive inclusive growth as well, and not just uh, directing people to those um, usual tourist uh, hot kind of hotspots, as it were. Rowan, um, hello from Belbaxter. I'm a Madras FP, and I should have gone to Belbaxter actually. I'm from Ceres originally. My sister went, but it was a wee while ago now. So in terms of the decks, yes, at the moment, we already fund the DICS, so um, de the Development Education Centres, which essentially provide CPD for teachers. A lot of their work's moved online. In fact, all of their work has moved online because of the pandemic, because, of course, your teachers can't get out of school, so they have to do everything online. Um, but I don't think it's just about the work of the DICS. I'm really keen that we look at other subjects in the school, and Liam and Morris will be fed up of hearing me talk about being a modern studies teacher, but I do think there's a role for modern studies in the curriculum more generally in terms of encouraging um, greater, I suppose, global citizenship. But how we evidence that in government, I think, is a challenge as well sometimes. So I think the curriculum in Scotland lends itself to some of these subjects, and um, it's politicians' jobs to sometimes find out a bit more about what's going on in our local schools. I spend a lot of time before the pandemic going into my local schools and asking questions of young people. And then with regard to um, the question in terms of Scotland's history with Malawi and what our response would be, I think there was a, a point made about the emergency response. So at the moment, I mentioned the £2 million pounds COVID response. We also have the HEF panel. Um, there's a million pounds in the HEF fund, which is used for an emergency response. Um, that's triggered when the deck appeal goes out. So um, that kind of ties in the, the government's current response um, to emergency situations. But in terms of preventative measures, um, which was mentioned, I think it's really important we look now through our International Development Fund at capacity building work. So NHS Scotland working directly with health partners in our partner countries is a really good example of that. We've also got examples of Police Scotland and uh, Scottish Water working directly in our partner countries, helping to build capacity. So we're moving beyond that aid agenda. And I'm probably well over time, Talat, so I'll stop. Thank you, Jenny. Uh, Morris, can I go to you next? Thank you. Thanks. Yeah, uh, the first one in terms of international travel and airports, I mean, the contribution to climate change from international travel is, is, is tiny. And I think it doesn't risk meeting our net zero targets. What does risk meeting our net zero targets is not being able to do the basic things like recycle our waste uh, at least to 50%. Uh, we're, we're below that and it's on the decline, which is really disappointing. But we've also got to tackle transport emissions, which uh, it, uh, particularly electrifying um, and providing more charging points. We also need to look at agriculture and work with our farmers and food producers to produce uh, food in a, in a low carbon uh, manner. I think that's all entirely possible. Uh, we need to tackle uh, uh, how we heat our homes as well and make our homes more energy efficient and we need to do these basic things uh, in order to meet net zero if we we do what we've done over the last five years you can forget about it it will not make a difference uh, we need an absolute sea change in the scottish parliament uh, and in the scottish government in terms of how we deal with climate change because it's uh, utterly embarrassing at this moment in time and I hope we, we see that. Uh, Raman's question was a, a great one. I, I love um, the global citizenship and the development education centres. I think we need to continue that. I'd like to see uh, more of a focus uh, in terms of uh, sustainable de development and indeed the circular economy in schools. I think that's absolutely critical um, to, to building uh, that um, global community as well. Father Leonard mentioned, you know, building resist, re resilience and, and not just thinking about uh, emergencies, although clearly there's an impetus to act. And, you know, I think we need to look at how we manage um, the uh, riparian waterways, 
uh, countries. The EU Water Framework Directive is an excellent piece of legislation for, for, for using as a toolkit for both dispute resolution, but also uh, ways in which to prevent and mitigate against floods, uh, use of sustainable urban drainage. And I think Scotland has a, has a massive role in terms of providing um, some of the lessons that we've had to learn um, directly to our global community in order that we can help prevent or at least mitigate um, any um, disasters or indeed issues going forward. Thank you. Thank you. Can I invite Liam MacArthur, please? Thanks, Helen. Um, I'm conscious that as um, I have represented Orkney in the Scottish Parliament for the last 14 years. I'm probably the last person to be lecturing anybody on um, taking fewer flights, but a little like Jenny, um, the last year um, has seen me adapt um, my working patterns fairly dramatically. I wouldn't say I have the smallest carbon footprint of any uh, MSP in the last session, but it certainly plummeted over the, uh, over the last 12 months. I think there is a, I, in, in answer to the question, do I think we should reduce international flights? I think we should place them. They should they, they should bear the full carbon cost of what a uh, an, an international flight entails. So they, it recognises the environmental impacts. I'm not saying that just because it costs twice as much to fly from Edinburgh to uh, Kirkwall in Orkney as it does to fly from um, London to New York or, or, or London to Johannesburg. Uh, but I think we do need to reflect the, the environmental cost in the pricing that airlines are able to charge. I think in terms of tourism, we need to do that smarter. We're already seeing uh, a growth in so-called green tourism. How green some of it is compared to others um, is, is an open question, but we do need to, I think, um, see our tourism sector adapt. This is, a, this is a sector that is vital for every single part of the country, almost without exception. And as we recover from the pandemic, we will require tourism to shoulder some of that responsibility. But we can't just go back to doing what we did before. And therefore, I think there's a challenge to the tourism sector, as there is to other sectors, to try and reduce um, the carbon footprint and the overall environmental impact of that tourism. But tourism can help raise awareness about the natural environment, et cetera, which helps in delivering other policy objectives. On, uh, on Rowan's question, absolutely. I'm as signed up as Morris and Jenny uh, to global citizenship. I've had the opportunity to um, live for a year with a family in Mexico. I've worked um, overseas as well. Um, the more that, I, I mean, I have, I'm firmly believe that travel broadens the mind and therefore the, uh, the, the more we can inculcate that in young people from an early age, uh, the better. I know I didn't go to any, anywhere quite as prestigious as Bell Baxter or, or Madras, but um, the, my former school, Sandy, uh, on the small island in the north of Orkney, um, won a competition at the time that um, the then First Minister, Jack McConnell, signed the cooperation agreement between Scotland and, and Malawi. They formed a relationship as a result with Minga School on the outskirts of Lilongwe. And that relationship in terms of what it delivered for not just the staff and pupils in Minga, um, but the staff and pupils in, in Sandy School in terms of opening um, their eyes, widening their horizons, I think cannot be underestimated. And so the value of global education, um, glo global citizenship as part of our education offering, um, I, would, I would entirely concur with. And in terms of Father Leonard's question, it's almost as if I anticipated it. It's the point I was making before that efforts to move to that capacity building and that resilience um, building, uh, I think, have been have been taken forward by successive Scottish governments. I think, unfortunately, with each disaster, whether it's flooding, whether it's um, uh, drought, whether it's a disease outbreak, sees those resources transferred to dealing with the emergency, the, the immediate uh, em emergency at hand. I think it's why it's so important that we continue to support and use Scottish government money to leverage in the money from other sources. And it's why the Scotland-Malawi partnership, I think, has been so successful 
that for every pound the government spends, it's leveraged in 200 pounds in resources from Civic Scotland. And I think the value of that in terms of what it gives, in this case to Malawi, but can deliver in other countries, it, in terms of that building of capacity, um, shouldn't be underestimated. And I think just finally, I would echo the comments I think Jenny was making about it's not just about the money, it's about the in-kind support and the expertise that we can help share, whether it's through um, Scottish Water or, or Police Scotland or our universities. Um, those are ways, I think, of, of thinking more smartly about what, how we can, uh, we can deliver benefit and, and share experience. Thank you. Can I move to Katie? Thank you. Um, Tala, the first question about um, international travel and tourism, I think it is incredibly important. And, you know, I think we do need to review so many aspects of life after the pandemic. Um, hi, Patrick, <laughs> you've joined us. Um, and I do think um, that that means that, you know, we shouldn't be as, as reliant on international travel by air. We need to look at how we, where we can use other modes of transport, in particular trains and um, other modes of transport rather than relying on flights. Um, but also it's not just tourism, it's the business sector as well. And I think the pandemic has shown that there's many other ways of doing business rather than getting on a flight. And I very much hope that business do respond to the pandemic by using some of the ways that we found of working during COVID, um, but also actively you know, support that, not just because it's cheaper and because it works, but also from a climate change um, perspective. I, I really hope that, you know, it's not just government, um, that it's also um, all in society that really start to have that di debate about why we make the decisions we do in our lives. Um, in terms of the question from Rowan, um, Labour is fully um, and completely um, supportive of global um, citizenship in schools and would indeed maintain that funding um, and indeed again um, fully supportive and um, supports the uh, development education centres. This is very much um, something that we want to see um, expanded and developed and to ensure that young people have many many opportunities to discuss and engage with these issues and have an understanding of many of um, the you know the the themes that are being discussed at this event this evening but of course that can't happen in a vacuum we need to make sure that debate is happening across society and is reinforced across society and these issues are higher up the political um, agenda um, in terms of the specific question for from father leonard about um, prevention of na natural disasters and mitigation um, the biggest obviously impact um, and the biggest factor um, in relation to this is climate change. And we've already discussed COP26, but you know, making sure that we do get ambitious and radical action out of COP26, that we raise the awareness um, of those issues, I think is you know, in incredibly important. Um, Labour is in particular committed to a significant increase in the Climate Justice Fund, but in terms of prevention, um, I do think really, really putting the climate um, issue at the top of the agenda is one of the most important things we can do to try and um, do the preventative work on natural disasters. That's not obviously instead of other action that needs to be taken to address disasters when they happen. Um, but I think it's you know really, really um, constructive and helpful that the prevention issue has been raised. Thank you, Katie. And can I take this opportunity to, to welcome Patrick Harvey from the Scottish Greens. Hi, Patrick. Hello, I'm so sorry for, for having been late. Um, uh, as you may know, it's our party conference this weekend and a, a, another meeting overran. I, I, I really apologise. Patrick, I appreciate that you will want to catch your breath, but we're really not going to let you as punishment for being late. So we're <laughs> going to go straight into, um, I'll repeat the three questions that were just asked because um, you've, only, you've only missed one round of questions. So I'm going to repeat the um, three questions that were just asked. Uh, the first was on... Um, was from, if you bear with me, I'm just going to pull it up here. Given Scotland's commitment to net zero carbon emissions, should we be reducing international flights through our airports and reduce our economic dependence on international tourism? That was a question from Jenny Patton-Williams. The second question was from Rowan, and it was about um, funding and evaluating 
of uh, global citizenship education through development education centres and the and a, a commitment to valuing and funding those and the third question was from um, Father Leonard Chitty and it was about tackling and mitigating um, the, um, the root causes of climate change rather than responding simply to emergency but what preventative measures should be um, prioritised. So those three questions please Patrick if we can give you an opportunity to reply. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, I'll take the middle one first if that's okay because the other two fit quite well together. Um, yeah, the, the, the role of citizenship education and I think the broadest possible meaning of it, the, the kind of holistic sense of what it is to be a citizen in the modern world, but what it is for Scotland to be a citizen of the world, uh, it, it's very important to us. I, I recently co-hosted uh, a session with uh, Lewis MacDonald from the Labour Party with uh, a range of uh, folk involved in uh, citizenship education centres from uh, from Glasgow and around the country uh, and I think there genuinely is uh, an appetite for this and the the International Development Cross Party Group has uh, I think demonstrated that there's a strong uh, appetite for, for seeing this uh, continue to develop as an agenda across the political parties and I you know I genuinely do think it's an example where there's there's common thinking uh, irrespective of which side of the constitutional debate we're on, you know, in, in session one of the Scottish Parliament, there was probably a little bit of reluctance to get into issues around international development. But the Labour Lib Dem coalition in the second session did start to talk about these issues more, did start to develop the idea that Scotland could have a role, that devolved administration could have a role in these issues that's been developed further in every session since then. And I genuinely think across all the parties, there's an appetite for that. Uh, on on climate, I mean, the the root causes of 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 climate uh, crisis, the climate climate emergency, and the the nature and biodiversity emergency that we're living with as well, uh, fundamentally are about human activity, and they're about human economic activity. I think if we want to tackle the root causes, we have to challenge this notion that uh, human economies can grow forever. Uh, and that we measure growth in this very simplistic, narrow sense of, you know, how much GDP is circulating in the economy. Uh, what's the, uh, we, we talk about productivity uh, in, a, in a narrow sense as well. We don't recognize how productive our land is or isn't anymore uh, in biodiversity terms, in ecological terms. Uh, a fifth of Scotland's land mass uh, has been given over to, uh, to grouse moors, uh, which is, the absolute opposite of, of a healthy, productive ecosystem. Uh, so challenging that economic model that says growth, growth, growth uh, has to be uh, at the root of, of what we do to, uh, to look at the, the root causes of, of that environmental crisis, uh, multiple environmental crises that we've created because they are economic in nature. They've been brought about by an extractive, exploitative economy. Um, and the, the example of flights is, I think, just one, uh, one example of that. The idea that we all have an entitlement to fly uh, as often as we want, as far as we want, I'm afraid is something that needs to be challenged. We don't need to dig up the runways to plant cabbages. Uh, I think you know, nobody across the green movement globally is saying that we have to abandon aviation, but it has to exist within limits. Uh, and you know, if we want, for example, I see I see a Liam's on the on the call. If we want, for example, island communities to be able to use lifeline flights for genuinely essential purposes, then part of the flip side of that is that we need to recognise that those of us in, in the central belt should not be flying to London. The idea that the UK government is about to cut aviation taxes on short-haul domestic flights between the central belt of Scotland and London. That is absurd. We're going to need to, as we recover from the pandemic and as the aviation industry asks for a handout, please, from the, from the public purse for its recovery, I think we need to say that recovery has to be within limits and we should not be regrowing aviation to the pre-pandemic levels. Thank you, Patrick Harvey. Um, we will 
We're going to um, firstly to um, the questions, the next round of three questions, which will include one that I will be inviting a partner on to ask their question. Um, but first, let's go to the questions that have come from the group. Firstly, we have uh, Melanie Scott. Scottish Enterprise funding has included over 8 million to arms companies in Scotland to export military equipment, including weapons used against civilians in Yemen. Should you be elected, will you pledge now to ensure and monitor that all funds given to armed companies are used solely for diversification or transition to green jobs? That's from Melanie Scott. And can I ask our second question is from, I think, Paul Bradley, who will ask a question on screen about the wellbeing bill. Hi, Paul. Hi there. Thank you. I'm not, not sure my webcam is working, um, but you can hear me okay? Yes, you can hear you, no problem. Okay. Thank you. Well, thank you for your time this evening. Um, over 70 organisations recently signed SDG Network Scotland's open letter to Scottish party leaders calling for your parties to commit to bringing forward a wellbeing and sustainable development Scotland bill during the next parliament. The bill would ensure a coherent approach to policy making towards not just the realisation of the UN sustainable development goals by 2030, but going even further from ending poverty, tackling inequality, and combating climate change, both in Scotland and overseas. Tonight, we've heard about a need to progress on climate to be inclusive. We've heard about the need to, de to deliver on targets by 2030, the need for global citizenship, education, and more. These are positive words. My question to those on the panel is, will your parties commit to such a bill that explicitly prioritizes well-being and sustainable development? And if not, what is your party going to do to ensure that Scotland's commitment to the Sustainable Development Goals is more than just words and allows for healthy, robust scrutiny from the Scottish Parliament to ensure progress is made? Thank you, Paul. And our third question is from Jessie Normis Child. And she has said, reducing carbon has to include fossil fuel workers. What action would you take in, in just transition to move people into less carbon reducing work, i.e. into renewables? So this time, can we start with uh, Liam MacArthur, please? Thank you. Yeah, thanks very much, uh, Tal. I'll take those uh, in order. In terms of Melanie's question about um, funding support through the enterprise agencies, um, Scottish Enterprise in this instance for uh, companies involved in the, the arms trade. I mean, I think we're seeing increasing public pressure, whether it's in relation to um, the arms sector, whether it's in relation to um, the oil and gas sector for um, for defunding. I, I think I can understand it and, and, and I'm broadly supportive of that direction of travel. However, we need to be clear about what it is that we're, we're defunding. I'd be interested to know precisely what it was that Scottish Enterprise had supported, what element of um, the work being undertaken uh, was uh, in receipt of, of um, whatever grant was was made available. I'm not sure whether Jenny will be able to shed any light on that from a um, from a, a ministerial perspective, but I, I, I rather suspect that there will be restrictions in place um, for, uh, for 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 exports um, that will have a bearing on whatever funding is uh, is available through the the enterprise agencies. Um, even if those export uh, restrictions are uh, are uh, a reserve matter to the UK uh, Parliament, the UK government. In terms of Paul Bradley's question, um, I, I think I think the argument for a well-being and sustainable development um, bill um, seems to be a, a pretty compelling one. Um, I, I think, from experience, getting people to agree to the the long title and the broad concept of a bill can often be relatively straightforward. What you then populate that bill with um, is a matter of, 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 of a great deal more angst and, and, and perhaps controversy. Um, but I think Paul's point generally about um, living up to the, 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 the aspirations, the ambitions, the commitments we've made in terms of the sustainable development goals is one we should be prepared to follow through where that is not already set down. Now, I'm not somebody who believes that the only way of achieving anything is to put it in black letter law. Um, and I think sometimes governments of all political, uh, political colours and parliaments 
on a cross-party basis have got themselves into difficulties by somehow believing that that, um, that is possible. But I think the, the broad principle set out by Paul is, is, is a, a sound one and, and uh, hopefully one that can be taken forward on a collaborative basis in the next session. And in terms of Jesse's point about um, those working in, whether the oil and gas sector or indeed any other of the uh, fossil fuel industries, I think she makes an, a, a, an entirely valid point about what the just transition in part needs to be about. Um, it's all very well to say um, that we need to move away from uh, activity uh, in certain sectors or indeed um, to alter the way in which activity in certain sectors takes place. Um, uh, there's an obvious uh, example for saying that um, if we are to make the, the progress we need to make in terms of um, the, uh, the development of renewables, a lot of the answers are to be found within the supply chain of the oil and gas sector. And therefore, one would assume that there is um, a, a not, a, not a simple transfer, but probably a more straightforward transfer of the skills there um, from where they are at the moment to where they need to be in the future. Um, I've always been taken by um, uh, former Unison um, lead uh, Dave Watson's idea of a carbon army, that um, there are a range of areas where the skills that will be needed are different from the ones that are needed at the moment, but where we have a base, an industrial base, an academic base um, uh, to, 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 to develop that will allow us to, to build those jobs into the future. But it needs to be a just transition. We can't simply say we are turning the key in the lock here um, and you need to just back off and, and, and we'll give you as much training as we, we can, but you're, you're going to have to fend for yourself. The timeframes are going to be frustratingly um, slow for, 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 for some people. Um, and in a climate emergency, to have a transition seems to, to, to be an inadequate response. But I think if we are not to cause absolute chaos in certain sectors, in parts of our economy, and indeed in communities um, in, in different parts of the country, it does need to be a transition. And a transition that's informed by those that we're asking to transition, uh, not simply being imposed uh, upon them. Thank you. Can I can I now go to Patrick Harvey? Thanks very much. Um, I mean, I suppose all three of these these questions raised the same slight discomfort with me, uh, and it it relates to to something that Liam was talking about about when he was addressing the issue of a well being bill that you can uh, you can agree. Uh, you know that the, the difficult bit might be in the title. Um, that that doesn't necessarily feed through into what's in the substance. Uh, I think you know. Obviously, we haven't published our manifesto yet, but when we do, I think you will see a lot about what a well-being economy means uh, and how to make that a reality. But it's something that I think everybody likes to talk about, uh, and not very many people like to follow through on the logic of. Uh, you know, changing the priorities. You know, for example, we have um, an environmental protection agency in Scotland uh, that was given a legal duty to put economic growth ahead of environmental protection. Uh, and that was framed as sustainable economic growth. There's a desperate searching uh, in, in many political parties for language which allows them to present business as usual as though it has changed. Uh, allows them to present plain vanilla economic growth uh, policies as though they are sustainable. And they're not. There is a fundamental contradiction between sustainability uh, and that, you know, old style economic policy. So we can talk about well-being and there will be some people who totally get what that means and are willing to follow through in the logic and see the transformational potential of an idea like that. And there will be other people who say, yeah, fully signed up to the idea of a well-being economy. Uh, and what they mean is, you know, at best, a little bit of mitigation of the harm that our existing economic systems do to people uh, and to the planet. So, yeah, you will, you will see in our manifesto positive uh, arguments about what a well-being economy means. But I don't think it's going to be an easy debate if we, if we get that agenda, if we get that issue onto the agenda in the next session of the Scottish Parliament, 
there will be very deliberate concerted attempts uh, to twist it into uh, just a different version of business as usual. Um, and the, the same issue with, with fossil fuel transition. People like to talk about a transition. People like to talk about a just transition. But they don't necessarily like to talk about a transition on the scale and the pace that is required. We've still got UK and Scottish governments that support new exploration licenses, going looking for even more oil and gas, uh, and are willing to, to continue with the existing undeveloped licenses, even though we know that in the developed reserves of fossil fuels, we have far more of the stuff than we can afford to burn. Right? So if you want to talk about a just transition, it needs to be a fast enough transition uh, that we are going to live within our ecological uh, means. And at the moment, what we have is uh, a transition which is barely even underway. It is not on the scale and pace that is required. And if it is, that's why we need large scale role of the state in building up the sustainable industries that will create prosperity and, and secure high quality jobs for the future without crashing our planet. Transition is not like diversification. It is not about saying, let's have some renewables as well as our existing economy. It's about saying the stuff we have to stop doing. And, and most political parties, I think, are not at that point. And diversification also came up in relation to the uh, question about the arms trade. And yes, Scottish Enterprise does support the arms trade. Uh, companies like Raytheon, uh, uh, um, uh, um, Leonardo, uh, the, there have been companies that have produced uh, weapons uh, that are being used in uh, in Yemen, in uh, in, uh, in Hong Kong, you know, blue light services, so-called, the Scottish government likes to say, uh, you know, the, these, these particular companies, uh, they don't fund the military, they only fund blue light services, because the emergency services, they are keeping everyone safe. Well, not in a lot of countries, they're not. In a lot of countries, including the US, uh, the Greens have been persistent in calling out this funding and saying we should stop funding um, any companies that are providing arms uh, such as those being used to, to brutalize uh, black lives in the US where, where you have a systemically racist police force. Um, so yeah, the Greens have been very, very active in saying diversification is not a good enough excuse for continuing this because these companies might choose to say, we're going to have a, a little bit of extra non-military activity. We'll increase that, that side of our business and we'll call that diversification. It doesn't mean they're stopping doing the stuff which is killing people and which is actively being used uh, in some of the greatest uh, scale uh, atrocities and human rights violations on the planet at the moment. So yeah, Scottish government should be absolutely cutting off those industries as well as the industries that are involved uh, in the nuclear weapons supply chain as well. Thank you, Patrick Harvey. Can I go to Katie Clark, please? Thank you. Um, uh, thank you, Melanie. Um, as someone that's been involved in campaigning against um, arms exports to Saudi Arabia for many, many years, um, I um, completely support um, what you're saying and the sentiments of what you're saying. I mean, obviously, as I mentioned earlier, um, the UK has granted 6.7 billion pounds of arms export licenses to Saudi Arabia. Um, to be used in Yemen um, this year um, and you know fueling the war in Yemen um, it is not the appropriate foreign policy response to the humanitarian crisis that's going on there we're also seeing as we've said already cuts in the aid budgets of about 50 percent um, to Yemen um, the basis in which I've campaigned against arms sales to Saudi Arabia has been on the human rights aspects the human rights abuses in Saudi Arabia rather than the env environmental grounds that you're quite rightly raising. Um, but yes, indeed, it shouldn't be the case that government agencies um, are supporting this work. I mean, Scotland has massive arms exports, not just to Saudi Arabia, to many other countries. Uh, and that is an issue that we need to look at and we need to take into account the environmental aspects as well as the, the wider human rights and, and other aspects um, that that um, impacts. Um, Labour um, Paul supports a, a well-being and sustainable development bill. Um, there's been talk about black letter law, so I'll be clear in terms of what we mean by that. Um, what we think the um, suggestion is, is that that bill would make all public bodies um, uh, responsible for setting 
objectives towards sustainable development outcomes um, and um, looking at the impact that their policies have on people and the environment um, both here in Scotland and globally. There's also obviously wider issues about other sectors of the economy uh, outside the public sector um, and that also needs to be looked at, looked at but in terms of the specific proposals round about a sustainability bill, Labour um, is fully supportive and campaigning for that and indeed um, we continue to support Scotland's status as a fair trade nation um, and ensuring that all fair paid trade products are included in public sector and procurement policies. Um, in terms of um, uh, the question round about um, the, the third question round about oil, gas and other fossil fuels, um, I think there's a lot of parallels with the issue around the arms in terms of how do you shift you know, how do you shift economic decisions um, and the experience of working class communities over generations is that if jobs go nothing come in their place so obviously those that are working in oil and gas those that are reliant on fossil fuels are not um, going to just believe that there's going to be other jobs there if those sectors go so we do need to put the work in first into how you diversify um, and I mean Patrick sort of explored a lot of the issues and the conflicts between um, sustainability and economic development um, but of course, it's, you know, I think as you, you also actually alluded to, it's about what you see your economy as being and what you want the economy of the future to look like. And it has to be an economy based on a green industrial revolution. It has to be about those green jobs of the, the future. So the whole of our, um, you know, public policy needs to be looking at how we move into that direction, how we make sure that investment is in how we want the economy to look in the future. If we look at what's just happened with the pandemic, that's not what's happened at a UK level in terms of furlough, etc. The money has been available to, to all sectors. Um, and, you know, we do need to think about we, as we build back and as we build, as we come out of the pandemic, what do we want the economy to look like in the future? COP26 gives us a massive opportunity to try and put that debate centre stage in, in Scotland and try and build support amongst the public and in communities for really building back in a way that delivers the green jobs and delivers the kind of economy and indeed industrial development that we need to have, not just here in Scotland, but globally. Hey, Katie, can I turn to Jenny Gilruth, please? Um, so the first question from Melanie with regards to arms funding, I mean, I would probably start by saying the Scottish Government does not um, directly fund the manufacture of arms, but I think the question itself lends itself to a discussion around about policy coherence. So it's a, an issue that's been raised with me on a, a number of occasions as Minister, and I know it's obviously in the Alliance's manifesto as well. Um, we had the first meeting of the uh, Ministerial Group for Policy Coherence last Monday, so that work has started, but it's in the gift of the, the Scottish people who forms the government. But I do think it needs to be looked at. Um, Liam, I think, thought that I would know the specific answer to this. I don't, because funding for Scottish Enterprise doesn't sit with me, it sits with um, business ministers, I think, I think it sits with Jamie Hepburn actually, so um, on the specifics it would come from his side, but I think the issue here is policy coherence and I'm going to come on to talk to that with regard to I think the second question which was from Paul on the legislation point. So again, as I've mentioned, um, our manifesto is not published yet, so I can't prejudge what that's going to say, but just to kind of go back over some of the areas in which we're already moving towards with regard to well-being. Um, we already have the national performance framework, so that gives us a framework for collaboration and planning. That's benchmarked against the SDGs. You know, Patrick spoke about the well-being economy and moving quickly. I think that's hugely important. It has to be a priority. And this election is so important in that respect as we rebuild after the pandemic. Um, and in terms of that policy coherence work, I, I discussed the, the work at ministerial level, um, but we also recently published Scotland's Vision for Trade, which sets out five principles and they're aligned with the NPF2. And on that, it was important to me that we aligned our work on fair trade with what we're doing in terms of the trade vision. And I spoke um, at length to my colleague Ivan McKee on that to make sure we had that coherence. I think it's hugely important. With regard to the green recovery, though, and in terms of the just transition principles, again, that is embedded across government policy, but I think the pandemic itself has required a reset and we need that just transition to build back better, of course, but we need to create green jobs 
and enable that just transition in investments. And I think that, you know, Katie spoke about working class communities. I, I represent many working class communities in my own constituency. And I think about what a just transition means for them. It needs to mean jobs in the local community. It needs to mean opportunities for them. And it's a responsibility of uh, whichever government is elected after the May election to make sure that happens for the people who need it most and who ultimately have been harmed, I think, um, most by some of the effects of the pandemic. Thank you, Jenny. And Morris, can I finally turn to you for this answer? Uh, thank you. Uh, firstly, from Melanie, I, I don't know the specifics um, um, of the question. I think uh, neither does Jenny or perhaps anybody else. So I'm sorry you don't get a specific answer on, on that Scottish enterprise investment. But I think we need to look at the defence sector overall. When I worked with Zero Waste Scotland, um, the Scottish Government funded us to look at circularity within the aerospace, defence and marine sectors in order to make them uh, more sustainable. And I think the sector also uh, provides uh, many high, highly skilled jobs. And if we weren't going to support that sector, we'd need to look at how we were able to compensate and provide those jobs. And I've got a few ideas on that when we come on to the final question. The middle one um, on the wellbeing bill and, and, and sustainable development, I think that it could be very beneficial, um, particularly if it provides extra scrutiny. But my experience from five years in Parliament is when politicians talk about introducing bills um, setting up working groups, commissions, it usually means they're not going to do anything about it. And I'd be really cautious that anything we do, any legislation, it has to actually make a difference. Otherwise, we should just be doing it anyway. And it, it is very frustrating seeing that happen over five years and looking back and thinking, why didn't we make some progress? Um, on the final point from Jesse, I mean, I think a just transition is absolutely critical to our 100,000 um, North Sea uh, workers and throughout the supply chain. I think we need to use far more uh, hydrogen and carbon capture and storage, uh, as well as expand particularly our offshore renewables and offshore wind. And I think we could be quite innovative with the sorts of infrastructure projects we we build. For example, we could build a plastics recycling plant because currently only 2% of plastics collected for recycling in Scotland is actually recycled in Scotland. That's only 2%. We also know that there's 471 oil and gas platforms in the North Sea, 5.5 million tonnes of steel, and that all has to be de decommissioned. I'd love to see that happen in Scotland by building an electric arc furnace to re recycle that steel and provide jobs locally. So there's a lot of work to do, but we absolutely have to start that just transition process as soon as possible. Thank you. Thank you to the panel for their answers there. Um, that is all we have time for in terms of questions. And I know uh, questions came in thick and fast when, whilst we got to the end of the um, panel, which is what happens every time. But we will be sending those questions to the panellists for responses and writing and hopefully be able to respond to what everyone has said. A huge thank you to all of you for uh, um, submitting questions and uh, participating and making this interactive. What I will be doing is asking all party spokespeople to give a brief two minute closing summation um, about uh, their party's uh, views and positions in the lead up uh, to the 2021 election on international development. And I'd like to start with uh, Morris Golden, please. Thanks for that. Um, yeah, just to, to wrap up and actually the, the kind of final question on the um, uh, on the chat box there was around consumer behaviour. And I think just to start with that point, I think we, we really need to change how we consume. I mean, most of us have clothes in our wardrobes that we don't wear anymore. Most of us have gold jewellery, either I don't personally have myself, but within the household I certainly do. And if you think about the, the gold mining industry, globally employs 600,000 children in some of the worst conditions you could ever imagine. 
uh, dealing with lots of toxic weights, such as cyanide and mercury. And we need to change how we consume. We need to move to more uh, models of, of, of renting, of, of reusing when we can. And I think that would help with, con with the consumption of many of those materials. I mean, if you look at a, a mobile phone like this uh, iPhone, you know, it's so difficult to repair. And that is something that's, that's hurting uh, many people in the world, as well as uh, not helping us here in Scotland. So we need to, to, to really change uh, how we uh, consume, how we react. And I hope that we'll see more of a circular economy approach at both Scotland and, and UK levels and ideally uh, globally as well. Um, I wanted to mention as well that I went uh, with Kate Forbes actually, who's uh, the finance minister, but wasn't at the time, over to Nepal with uh, Tear Fund to look at their work where we're looking at human trafficking, um, which was devastating to hear. But we were also looking at some mechanisms to support uh, local farmers. And one of the simplest things that Tear Fund did is they built a shed where the local farmers could store their produce and then that produce went in one block to market and they got a better price for it. So there's some really simple actions that can be uh, taken to help people. Um, I also think, as I mentioned earlier, we do need to tackle our water crisis, both in terms of sanitation and drinking water, but also access to our uh, riparian streams globally. And if we don't do that, then we face uh, water wars uh, being embarked on. And I think, I mean, I think on this call, it's a cross party effort to support the work that you do and everyone on the call in terms of sustainable development. And if I'm lucky enough to be uh, re-elected next time, then I hope I can play my part in doing just that. Thank you. Thank you. And can I go to Patrick Harvey, please? Uh, thanks very much. Um, yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll, I'll maybe just respond to one thing. I, you know, I, I know it's too late to get into inter-party banter at this point in the evening, but uh, you know, Morris's point about consumer behaviour. Consumer behaviour does have a role to play, of course, but it is very often used as an excuse by governments or big corporations to push responsibility down onto people with less power. Um, the Greens very strongly believe that it is the economic systems we live within, the economic systems we create and which are supposed to serve the common good, which need to be challenged. Uh, and if the pandemic has shown us anything, it's that when governments genuinely do treat an emergency like an emergency, they are capable of responding. And it's those governments which responded rapidly, decisively, uh, and with the common interest uh, of the people uh, as the priority that made the, the biggest impact on protecting their communities from COVID. The climate crisis, poverty around the world, uh, exploitation, uh, war. If we treat these emergencies as emergencies, uh, we can respond with the same decisive, rapid action uh, if we have the will to do it, uh, both by directly using the power of the state and by regulating the private sector. You know, free markets are free to exploit. That's why they shouldn't be uh, free, according to the, the, the kind of free market extremism that is dominant today. Greens believe that Scotland can have a really powerful, positive and constructive role in the world, challenging, for example, the cuts to international development funding that we've seen from the UK government, challenging also their brutal anti-migrant policies here at home, but also, you know, stepping away from some of the policies that the, the SNP have uh, adopted in recent years about being pro-NATO, we would like to see uh, Scotland as, a, as an international force for peace, uh, leaving that first strike right, nuclear alliance uh, and also abandoning the, the economic dependence on uh, the weapons of war, uh, which, you know, I, I know the phrase military industrial complex has gone a little bit out of fashion in recent decades, but there is still a, a very strong economic incentive for governments to serve the interests of 
the military industries, and that is absolutely at odds with the needs uh, of the, the people of this country and of the world. And the, finally, you know, as, as we prepare to, to have COP uh, here in Glasgow, just, uh, just 10 minutes away from my, my flat here in Partick, um, we need to show that Scotland is capable of doing the hard stuff, not just the easy stuff, not just putting a little bit of extra renewables on the grid, but actually breaking our dependence on fossil fuels. Greens have been successful in making the case for Glasgow and Strathclyde Pension Fund to divest from the fossil fuel industry. Uh, we should be making that kind of clear, decisive statement uh, and also kicking the fossil fuel lobbyists out of COP, where they have had far too much voice in previous conferences, uh, when that, that space and that voice ought to be given, uh, for example, to many of the countries in the global south uh, that are already being hit by the hardest impacts uh, of the climate emergency. So that's some of what the Greens will be standing for uh, in this election. And I really thank you both for your forbearance for my turning up a little bit late uh, and for the chance to speak to you this evening. Thank you, um, Patrick Harvey. Kitty Clark, can I invite you to give your summation, please? Thank you very much. And can I thank the Alliance and all the partner organisations for organising this event. I was only appointed a couple of weeks ago as the Scottish Labour spokesperson on international development. So this is the first event um, that I've attended in that capacity and I found it really interesting and I very much hope um, I'll be able to work with all the different organisations on all these issues going forward. Um, it's been said that, you know, it's about individuals and it's about consumers and, you know, that the, the government's got to recognise that, if you like. I mean, really what I would say is it's governments and public policy that determines the choices that people have in front of them. We were discussing earlier on international travel. Now, the reality is, before the pandemic, many people would get a flight because it was far, far cheaper to get a, on a plane than it was to get a train whether that was a domestic flight or indeed an international flight. So the role of government at all levels determines the choices that people have in front of them. And the role of government is to ensure that people are able to make the right choices and want to make the right choices because it's the most sensible um, choice um, to make. I mean, Labour's got a very good track record in international development. It's been said that you know, Jack McConnell started the work in terms of um, the Scottish Parliament. And we're very much committed um, as I've said, to uh, increasing the particularly the Climate Justice Fund, but also the policy um, coherence uh, for sustainable development um, that I know that the Alliance um, is um, campaigning for. And we very much see um, that this is about how we join up like decision making and how we join up policy. So, you know, it is about what do we do about the housing crisis, the fact that we have, you know, massive council house waiting lists throughout Scotland. What do we do about the fact that, that people can't afford to put their heating on? Well, what we do is we make sure that people have houses that are fit for purpose, that, you know, maintain the heat, that are well, well insulated. And that creates, obviously, the green, green jobs, not just in, in insulation and um, in making sure that those um, you know, houses and, and pe where people live is appropriate um, for the kind of climate that we have in this country and enables them to live a healthy life. But indeed, it has massive implications for the economy in terms of creation of green jobs. So in terms of um, international development, um, we do see very much the link between international development and all the other issues around about global justice and climate justice and trade justice. Um, that we've been talking about in the news today. We see that the, the issue of China and you know, whether we have a trade deal with China is an issue. We're gonna have a lot of issues coming up in the coming period about the direction um, that we take and Labour will be arguing uh, and I will be actively arguing as an individual um, for ensuring that we do proceed um, with government decisions at all levels, which ensure that we tackle the global injustices that we see around about us that we have a responsibility for, but we also have the power to actually challenge and to transform and to change. Um, and that's what I'll be campaigning for um, in this role. And I very much look forward to working with you as much as I possibly can, um, and indeed on a cross-party basis to make sure that we do deliver on that agenda. So thank you. Thank you. Can I invite Jenny Gilruth, please? Thank you, Tala, uh, for chairing this evening's really interesting event and also to the Alliance um, for organising tonight's event. International development is often lauded in the Parliament as a place in which there's cross-party consensus. And we've seen an element, I think, of that tonight, which is really positive. 
But I'm often struck by the response I get on social media when I tweet about the SNP's work in government on international development. People will regularly tell me that it's reserved, it's not for our parliament, we don't have a say in such matters. But the International Development Fund, as we've just heard, was initiated by the Labour Party and um, supported by the Liberals in government. And it's something my party were proud to continue our support of and to deepening and widening that offer. I was proud more recently to commit to our core funded bodies, the Alliance, the Scotland-Malawi Partnership, the Malawi-Scotland Partnership and the Fair Trade Forum, that their funding would not be affected by our review of international development in Scotland. I thought, and I still do, that the pandemic was a time for us to pause and to reflect on the purpose of our offer in Scotland. The Black Lives Matter movement continues to demand serious questions of all of us, and the international development sector has a key role to play in addressing that. I say that fully cognizant of my own privilege serving as a white minister in an almost completely white Scottish parliament. We all need to check our privilege. And this one is specific to Scotland. We need to stop pretending that we live in a policy vacuum. Cuts to the overseas development budget don't just harm the UK's international standing, they also harm the lives of the people that we want to help. Those most in need are being punished by political choices. So we can have a cross-party consensus on international development in the Scottish Parliament, but we must not ignore the bigger politics at play here, because it is hurting the world's most in need. Power reserved is power retained, and the Conservatives have used their power to punish those most in need in a global pandemic. And when a global pandemic hit the world's poorest, an SNP Scottish Government didn't turn away. When the Tory UK government stepped back, an SNP Scottish government stepped up with our COVID response. So we should be ambitious for our country's future in every policy area, not least in international development. Being a good global citizen means taking on responsibilities, and I hope for one that in this election people choose to vote for a party that will give them the full responsibilities of a normal, independent country. Thank you, Talat. Thank you, Jenny. And finally, Liam McCarter from Scottish Liberal Democrats. Thank you. Thanks, uh, Talat, and thanks um, for me for uh, to the Alliance for hosting this, and, and indeed for your manifesto, which I think is is full of some um, fascinating ideas that I'm sure are going to inform the manifestos of, of all of the parties. In this election, um, uh, Jenny's expression of the cross-party agreement that there is on this was was perhaps a bit more uh, pointed. I mean, I would simply um, make the point again that it's all very well advocating independence, but it gives us um, greater control over far, far less. And I think I would far rather have uh, us influencing what the UK as a whole is doing in international development, where it has been um, a success story over over many years, and that's why it's so regrettable. Um, that the uh, the current Conservative government have taken the stance that they have. I think the question here is not about the cross-party consensus. It's probably about where in the list of priorities international development sits. I don't think there's any dispute about where the importance of tackling the climate emergency sits, and that has, has certainly um, uh, gone up the political agenda uh, quite uh, significantly and quite rightly over recent years. Um, but I think it, it's it's what bandwidth there is within the debate um, that we uh, that we have in the run up to this election and thereafter uh, to accommodate some of the issues that have been quite rightly raised uh, this evening. Um, Liberal Democrats, I, I would argue, have a, a strong track record in terms of uh, our commitment to international development, whether it's back to the uh, Labour Lib Dem coalition that Patrick uh, referred to earlier in the initial stages of the Scottish Parliament and Scottish Government engaging in international development, the embedding of the 0.7% uh, target in, in, uh, in law, and indeed in securing the, the, the more stretching interim target of 75% cut in, uh, in emissions as part of the Climate Change Act, pushing the Scottish Government to go further than they uh, already had. But I, I think the, the, this is almost the best of times and the worst of times for addressing some of the um, inequalities and the weaknesses in our um, society and in our economy that COVID has exposed. I think there's an opportunity now to build back something far better, far fairer, far greener, um, far more conscious of our uh, obligations in terms of sustainable development goals. Uh, I would, um, I, I think Scottish Liberal Democrats are, are absolutely committed to playing our part in that, working as collaboratively and as cross part, on a cross-party basis as we can and generally even though this is an election pitch and we're all um, exposing and amplifying the differences and downplaying maybe some of the commonalities, I think there is a good deal of uh, common ground here. And, and ultimately, I think that is beneficial. We're more likely to achieve things. As, as Patrick said, yes, crisis has shown what can be achieved where there's a political will in a crisis. It has also come at a cost in terms of individual freedoms. 
and therefore I think we need to be cognizant that if we're to bring the public with us in what we need to do in tackling the climate emergency, in dealing with the, um, the, the, the injustices we see um, through our inter international development interventions, um, then, we, then I think we need to be aware um, that losing the public uh, in, in, in that effort will not help us as politicians, um, whatever our, our, our party, um, to deliver. But thank you again for, for hosting it. And I look forward to the many questions. I see the, the Q&A box is up to over a dozen again. I um, look forward to answering those questions in, the, in, in, in due course. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we will certainly send them round. Thank you to all panellists. Thank you for all um, party spokespeople um, for your answers, for your inputs. Um, I uh, just as a very quick wrap up, we've seen some consensus, uh, despite it being an election, there has been uh, some consensus. Uh, we've had answers that have clarified that it's the wrong time to be cutting overseas development assistance, particularly during COVID-19, where we have the, the impact of um, emergency intervention and why there needs to be a focus on preventative measures and systemic change, as opposed to uh, looking at surface level issues which will continue unless those roots are dealt with. The opportunity that COP26 in Glasgow gives us to be able to be ambitious on the climate, the need for policy coherence and international development not sitting at one side, but there being policy coherence across the board. We had broad um, support uh, for Rowan's call on funding development education centres and having global citizenship education curriculum as a core part of Scottish schooling and the importance of building forward better um, and the development across Africa in response to um, Father Leonard Chitty's um, uh, question um, in, in response to how we build forward post COVID-19. We also saw broad support for uh, the well-being, well-being and sustainable development commitments um, but we may need legislation to ensure delivery. We've seen some dividing lines, certainly in terms of uh, whether it is individual consumer behaviour uh, or it is in fact the impact of system change, government change and government interventions and what that allows individuals to do. Um, and of course, the small matter of the constitution, which will come up in every panel, I'm sure. Thank you hugely to those who have asked questions. Thank you um, to our panellists. Can I just finish by saying that you can read the Alliance's five point plan calling for the next Scottish Government to firstly tackle poverty and ensure equality and solidarity are at the heart of everything we do. To, to build an economy that puts people and planet first. Three, to champion climate justice and pledge support for those hardest hit by climate change across the world. Four, to protect and enhance Scotland's international development work. Five, invest in global citizenship education to empower future generations of Scots. The full Alliance 2021 manifesto is available on the Alliance website and I would really encourage you to read that. And finally, I would say whilst we use the time of an election to ask questions and pose challenges, that doesn't happen just at election time and international development and climate change is too important for us to only ask those questions at election time. So for those who haven't had questions answered and for those many, many people who are on the call today um, re responding out with an election after the election is done and holding people to account on what we care about is critical, not just an every five year opportunity. So um, hold to account and challenge uh, often as often as possible is what I would say. Thank you to everybody for participating. Thank you for your questions. Thank you to the Alliance for asking me uh, to chair today. I've thoroughly enjoyed it and to all the Alliance staff and partner staff who have made this happen. Thank you and enjoy the rest of your evening.